Now let's just begin with verse 7 of Colossians 1. <clears throat> and uh, see if the Lord will teach us some beautiful gospel truth in this passage of Scripture. Verse 7, as ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Now, when we're studying through these books, we, we uh, of necessity, have to sort of stop in the middle of, of a thought because we just can't uh, always spend the time to study a larger passage. But when he says, as you also learned, of course, he's talking about the gospel in verse 5. The gospel. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, verse 5, where have you heard before in the gospel of the truth, in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you, as it is in all the world, bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you, the since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God and truth, as you also learned of Epaphras, that gospel that accomplishes all of that. It teaches you the grace of God and truth, the gospel of his grace in Christ, as opposed to the false gospel of works that's preached in this religious world. And this is how people learn the gospel. They hear people preach it. You learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, the things that thou hast heard of me, Paul said to Timothy there, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Epaphras was a fellow servant to Paul and a minister of Christ to the church at Colossae. So you see the preaching of the gospel, which clearly this refers to, that gospel you learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant. So preaching the gospel and being faithful as a minister of Christ is the same thing. If you preach the gospel, you're a minister of Christ because he is the gospel. The word faithful is integral to the word minister. This is, of course, cause for self-reflection for me. Am I a faithful minister of Christ. Faithful here means about what you would think it would. It means one who can be relied on. A faithful minister of Christ. Now one that can be relied on is not just talking about somebody that shows up. We use the word faithful in that way sometimes. They're faithful means they, they attend the gospel. But this is not talking about just showing up when it's time to preach. I pray that you, by the grace of God, can rely on me to be a minister of Christ. That's the context here. A faithful minister of Christ. Faithful in preaching Christ. The words of Christ define what it means to be a minister as well as the word faithful does. It's one that can be relied on. And you must be a minister of Christ to be faithful because that's what God sent us to do. Can I be relied upon to preach nothing save Jesus Christ and Him crucified? That's the question and that's essential. Showing up is one thing. Preaching in season and out of season is one thing. But what are we a minister of? What is it that we minister? Do we preach the word, as the text says, the word? Christ is all in the preaching, or you don't have a faithful minister of Christ. God said, comfort my people, for example. How does that happen? What's your comfort? He maketh you to lie down in green pasture. He restores your soul.
what else has he commanded me to do? What was the Lord's message? He said, you teach them all things that I've commanded you. Go ye and preach the world to preach the gospel in all the, to every creature. Teaching them whatsoever things I've commanded you. What was his message? I am. I am the bread. I am the door. I am the truth, life, the way. Come unto me. That was his message. Whosoever believeth in me hath everlasting life. We're not only his ministers, but we're ministers of him. That's what it is. Do you need healing of your mind and your spirit? Christ is the balm of Gilead. Do you need to be saved? His name is Jesus, for he shall save. He'll save his people from their sins. Do you need, need peace this morning? <laughs> you know, we go through this life and we think we need things. There's certain things we think, boy, I need that and I need that. And then we come here and a lot of times the Lord is gracious to put us in our right mind. He sits us down and clothes us in the righteousness of Christ and puts us in our right mind and we were able to realize what do I really need? And do you need peace in your heart? Christ made peace by the blood of his cross. <laughs> to whom shall we go right now? <laughs> to whom shall we go? And the word minister here means one who executes the commands of another. <laughs> I didn't volunteer. We're ambassadors for the king. You know what else minister means? And this is interesting. We've seen this before, but I don't know if everyone here has heard this. Minister also means this. It, it, as I said, it means one who executes the commands of another. That's clear. The Lord gave us a commission. We're ambassadors of King Jesus. But you know what minister also means? You look this up in Strong's Concordance. The original word means this, a waiter. <laughs> one who serves food and drink. Is that not a beautiful definition of what we do? I want you to turn to Acts 17 too, because again, I know some of you have, seen, have heard this, but I, I don't know who all has and hadn't. I want you to see this. What a beautiful thing. Come and dine, the Lord said. Come and dine. <laughs> Acts 17 too. And keeping in mind that the word minister there, a faithful minister of Christ, a waiter. It literally says that. That's word for word. A waiter, one who serves food and drink. And listen, Acts 17, 2, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, <coughs> and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, that's what we were talking about this morning. It can't be denied, can it? If you reason with people your opinions, they've got their own opinions. If you reason with people all the deductive things that you've come up with, you know, I've written these things out and all that, they've probably got their own deductions that they've come up with. But reason with them out of the Scriptures. How are you going to argue with God? He reasoned with him out of the scriptures, opening and alleging. That word opening means about what you think. It means to open up, which in the case of the scriptures, it doesn't just mean he did this, <laughs> but he made it clear. He opened it up. He, 
he spoke clearly. But that word alleging is very interesting. It means to place beside or near, i.e. food placed on a table. You see what he did? He said, here's the bread of life right here, right in here, right here. What God said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of God's mouth. Here's what God said. Opening and alleging what? That Christ must needs have suffered. Christ crucified. That's our message. A faithful minister of Christ. God make me that. Paul was a waiter. <laughs> what was on the menu? The suffering and death of the Son of God. As surety, as a sacrifice, as the offering that God will accept for his elect. May he always be the only thing on the menu right here. And notice he identified him. This Jesus that I preached unto you, he's the Christ I'm talking about. He's the one. Verse 80 back in our text. Who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is what? <laughs> first, first shot. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. Your love for one another. What Epaphras told Paul about these people was concerning their love. It was great evidence of the Lord's blessing upon them. That's how you'll know that they're mine. And let me ask you this. Have we learned to differentiate between what passes for love in this world and the love of the brethren? Have you experienced the difference? I get along with, a, with, with about two people in this world that I can stand to even be with. And look, I'll just be real honest with you. Our neighbors ain't, ain't one of them. I just don't, I don't want to be unkind or unsociable or whatever you want to call it. But I, I talk to people in this world for five minutes and as they go on and on about themselves and what they've done and this and that and sometimes horrible things, I'm not interested. I have a couple of friends that I think are lost and, and we have a lot in common and I, I pray for them. And, and, um, and that's another thing, but the love of, of that God gives. <laughs> the way that he knits the hearts of his people together. It's different. It's special. It's precious. <laughs> that unity is like that, that ointment that ran down Aaron's beard. There wasn't anything else like it. It was prescribed by God. And it was precious to God and it was precious to his people. It was a sweet smelling savor unto God. That unity. <clears throat> love in the spirit. Love for Christ. Love for his people. Love for his minister is clearly included here in the context. The Lord was building a church in Colossae. And you could see that. You could see that it manifested itself in love. Knowledge puffeth up, but love buildeth up. Love in the spirit. Again, there are a lot of things called love in this world. This love we're talking about is the fruit of the spirit of God. There's nothing else like it. Verse 9, for this cause we also, since the day we heard about it, 
do not cease to pray for you. Isn't that interesting? I know Paul rejoiced to hear of that love. Don't you imagine it? It blessed his heart. I know it did. That's not what he said here. I know often he did say that he thanked God for the brethren and for the love they had, for the gospel and for one another. But there's a lesson here in what he said here. Paul said, I've heard a wonderful thing. I've heard about your love in the spirit. And here's Paul's reaction to that. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. This love, this unity, this fellowship, this blessing of God is so rare and precious. <laughs> and by God's design, it's fragile. I don't, I don't mean to say that, that uh, you know, God can give it and we can ruin it. it, it it's in God's hands, isn't it? If he blesses it and he prospers it and increases it, we can't mess that up. I'm not saying that. But by God's design, it's a fragile thing. It's so easily disrupted. And Paul understood this. That's why his first reaction to hearing of their love in the Spirit was not to think, well, everything's great there. No need to worry about them. His first reaction was, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. Paul came before the throne of God and said, God, fill them with the knowledge of your will. Is that what it says? with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. May God fill us with the knowledge of his will. You all know I was in religion for many years as a young man, teenager, and It was common to say we're seeking the will of God. We just want to we just want to seek God's will. God's will is clearly revealed. What are you looking for? What you, when you say that, what are you looking for? <clears throat> Knowledge of the will of God is not learning some secret intricacy intricacies in, in, in the Bible or God's purposes and all of the details in this world as they play out, we, we're not ever going to know that. He works in mysterious ways. But his will for us is clear as a bell. Knowing that is like knowing that Christ is all. Do, do we need to know that? And yet, does God need to teach us that? We know his will, but knowing his will, we want to know his will. God's will is to glorify his son. You'll say, well, I just want to be you know, in, in the will of God. Then you need to find out what God's doing. <laughs> He's glorifying his son. He's making a marriage for his son. But I, I tell you this, he's doing that in a bazillion different ways that we can't even see. Every second throughout this world, he's doing that. But I know how we do that. I know how we get in on that. We preach it. That's what he told us to do in that effort, in that purpose, in that ministry of glorifying his son, preaching. Hear him. Preach him. Worship him. 
Well, what is spiritual understanding in all knowledge of his will and spiritual understanding, Paul said? Spiritual understanding, again, religion. We're going to crack the Bible code. There's no code. <laughs> There's no secret code. Turn with me to 1 John 5.20. Please. Paul prayed for this church that God give them wisdom and spiritual understanding. What is that? The ability to unlock deep mysteries and and to have like epiphanies about things not revealed? No. First John 5 20, we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding. That's what Paul prayed for. May he give you an understanding, the knowledge of his will and understanding. Now, what is God, what, are we, what is it that we're taught that we know that God has revealed when he gave us an understanding? That we may know him. <laughs> it's not complicated, is it? I don't need to know the secret of, you know, every certain number of verse and every so chapter and, they do all kinds of weird puzzles in the script. That we may know him that is true. When God gives you an understanding, you're going to know Christ. You're going to lay hold, you're going to believe on his son. And we are in him that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. So it doesn't depend on our knowledge. Though I have all knowledge <laughs> and understand all mysteries and have not love. So it's not just about he has revealed to us. A lot of people think that, that salvation is knowing a lot about God. Knowing him is not that. It's not great intellectual understanding. It's spiritual understanding that we may know him that is true and we're in him that is true. Of God are you in Christ Jesus who has made unto us wisdom. It's not about our knowledge. We're in Christ and he's made unto us wisdom. Righteousness, sanctification and redemption. Even in his son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Verse 10 in our text. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. I want to talk about these three things in this verse. Walking worthy of the Lord, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. The title of the message is Worthy, Fruitful, and Increasing. Now, it's important to understand now that this is a continuation of the thought in verse 9. If your understanding of spiritual truth does not define who you are and what you do, then you don't have understanding. It just does. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Everything's different. Nothing is the same. First of all, let's consider this walking worthy. What is it about your walk that would make it worthy of the Lord? Well, it's just simply following him. It's following him. The whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 10 is about our walk. And I want you to notice how Paul summed that up. Look over there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's just sort of skim through chapter 10 so we get an idea of what Paul's 
dealing with there. Look at verse 6. Now these things were were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters as some of them were. Uh, verse 8, neither let us commit fornication. Verse 9, neither let us tempt Christ. Verse 10, neither murmur ye. Now all of these things, verse 11, happened unto them for in samples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Take heed lest you fall, verse 12. He talks about temptation and God is faithful. He won't suffer you to be tried beyond what you're able. It's not a question of, of you messing up what God has done for you. You can't do that. It's not about that. Uh, verse 14, flee from idolatry. We're one body, verse 17. No idols, again. Do we provoke the Lord, verse 22? Even talking about eating, eating things. And he said, all things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Just keep scanning on down there. Be a, be a partaker. For if I by grace be a partaker, why by evil spoken of? Whether therefore you eat, verse 31, or drink, whatsoever you do, do it to the glory of God. He's talking about doing. Don't do this. Do that. Give none offense, verse 32. Not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. And then how does he sum all that up? Now he's fixing to completely change thoughts, but before he does, you see in verse three, he completely changes thoughts. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, he goes on talking about completely different things. But before he does that, he says this, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. That's what it. That's what sums all of that up. <laughs> Walking worthy of the calling wherewith we are called, be ye followers of Christ, imitators of Christ, looking to Christ, trusting Him as our righteousness. We don't do what we do to establish righteousness. That's Paul said. The religious Jews are going about to establish their own righteousness. They haven't submitted to the righteousness of God in Christ. That's walking worthy. To walk in Him. To walk by Him. To walk for Him. To follow Him. To imitate Him. Secondly, consider what it is to be fruitful in every good work. Fruitful. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Fruitful in every good work. The Lord taught us what that is in Mark 14, 3. If you'd turn there with me, I, we won't go long, but I want you to see these scriptures today more than we ever have. Uh, Mark 14, 3. We will, uh, we'll get into verses 11 and 12, I think, another time. I, I want us to concentrate on this verse 10 and see these three things particularly, and how that Christ is simply all in these things. Walking worthy of him. How in the world are you going to do that? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. It's walking with your faith fixed on Christ and what he did for you. <clears throat> Mark 14, 3. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as our Lord sat at meat, 
There came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment, of spikenard, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. And look at this. There were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work. You want to know what the definition of a good work is? On me. On me. Why do you give? Why do you work up here and do things that need to be done? Why do you take the time to come in here? Why are you faithful to the ministry of Christ? Why does it take priority over everything? Why did this woman do this? She believed on Christ. <laughs> she didn't go around breaking alabaster boxes of spike nerd on everybody's head. She knew who he was. She believed he was who he said he was. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And faith has but one object. And I'll tell you what else about her. She loved the Lord Jesus. She loved him. <laughs> what is a good work on me? For those reasons, because of who he is. And because him having first loved us, we love him. If you love me, keep my commandments. Do what I say. If you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, but you're just trying to do good because you love yourself, you know most people do what they do because they love themselves. Even when it just happens to benefit somebody else. They're doing it for themselves. You know how I know that? Because I'm one of them. Yeah. If you do what you do because you love him who first loved you and gave himself for you, that's a good word. You know, I always mention Dorcas who made coats. When she died, everybody was sad and they talked about the coats that she had made for them. It's precious, isn't it? The little things that people do just for you. Because you're the people of God, the family. Increasing in the knowledge of God. If God gives you spiritual wisdom and understanding to know Christ, which is what we just saw in the previous verse, what are you going to do? He gives you spiritual wisdom and understanding, and we saw what that is. He gave us an understanding that we may know Him. <laughs> That's pretty clear. But what are you going to do when you know Him? You're going to want to know Him. The knowledge of God. Increasing in the knowledge of God. You're going to want to know Christ. To know God, it's the Son who reveals Him. You know that. No man knoweth the Father but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal Him. Why do we come to worship the Lord? Why do we do anything that we do? You remember Psalm 27? If you want to turn over there, we're closing with this. Psalm 27, 4.
Remember, we're talking about increasing in the knowledge of God. Maybe we need to all go to seminary, theological seminary, you reckon? Here's what David did. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after. I guarantee you this, whatever your desire is, whatever you're pursuing right now, that's what your desire is. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord. The fellowship of the saints is wonderful. But this is why we're here, to behold the beauty of the Lord. Can we preach the gospel in such a way that we see how altogether lovely the Lord Jesus is? And to inquire. I've got some questions. Did you come with some questions this morning? Did you come with a desire to gain something that you don't have? We behold his beauty. We know him. We rejoice in, in, in accomplished salvation in him. We rejoice in a conquering almighty captain of our salvation. We rejoice in his grace. We rejoice in all of his attributes and glory. But I came to get something too. You know what it is? If your one desire is to behold the beauty of the Lord, then what would you be inquiring about? More. (laughs) More about Jesus. Let me learn. More of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me. I want to see his beauty better. (laughs) I want to know more about how beautiful he is. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see more of his love who died for me. May God give us grace to desire this one thing, to dwell in his house. That doesn't mean we're moving in here. It means we dwell in his presence. We dwell as his family. We dwell in his household under his protection and provision and love. And as Paul said, that I may know him, that I may know him. Let's pray.